here, Chuck. That's all we're doing now, give me the ball. I recently had the opportunity to go on a wild boar hunt with my friend Joseph Carter, who's also known as the Mink Man on YouTube. Normally Joe uses his trained mink and dogs to hunt invasive species, as well as perform pest control jobs. I sometimes go with him and bring my own dogs along and film for his channel. I'll drop a link to his channel if you're interested in that sort of thing. Some of my favorite adventures have been with Joe, and my dogs love him too. On this occasion, we had the opportunity to meet and make some new friends and join them during a couple of nights of their Texas version of an invasive species pest control job. I don't want to dwell on the hunt itself too long and instead get to the examination of a purpose-built lithic I used on the hunt, but I think it's appropriate to cover just briefly the hunt. I do need to warn you though, this video is graphic in nature, and if you're sensitive to such things you may want to skip this video altogether today. There's not much napping involved, and instead I spend most of the time examining the lithic after it's been used. If you want to see more napping, come back later. I'm sure we'll have more of that content. In the Americas, wild boar are an invasive species. They were brought here with early European farmers, and soon escaped into the wild, becoming feral and epigenetically reverting back to their wild form, growing hair and tusks again. They are prolific breeders and wildly successful survivors in the Americas. Unfortunately, they are also extremely destructive to habitats that our native species rely on and also cause costly damage to farm crops. As an invasive species, there is usually no license or season required to hunt them in most states, and typically only landowner permission to trespass is needed to hunt them. They damage everything and they have the potential to really do epic harm. We haven't seen an invasive species like this. This will be the one that creates the most damage that we'll see. On this occasion, we were hunting with paid professionals who've been hired to remove hogs from the area. They use specially trained dogs just for this purpose. Man has been living and hunting with dogs for tens of thousands of years. It is likely this is the first thing that brought man and canine together. With dog and man working together, the odds of finding and dispatching prey are greatly increased, improving the odds that both will eat and survive. The working dogs on this hunt are trained to find and bay or circle and bark at a hog, keeping it cornered and busy until the humans can arrive as backup. They're on a shot, get up here, Chuck. Once the humans arrive, they can catch the hog by a foot and wrestle it over onto its side, where it can be controlled and quickly dispatched. It's a very hands-on type of hunting. This is where my purpose-built lithic comes into play. With the boar on its side, I aim for the heart and other vital organs for a fast and ethical kill. Invasive or not, no parties involved wanted to see the animal suffer longer than is necessary. The point plunged in without effort between the ribs and performed its intended purpose. To be honest, I expected more effort and resistance, but it seemed as if there was none required. The point was thin enough and sharp enough, but it actually surprised me how well it worked. The point itself is made from Texas Georgetown Flint, which just seemed appropriate for the occasion. It wasn't produced to resemble any particular archaeologically defined type or style, but the design choices were intentional. I hope to increase the odds of the point being successful as well as ethical. It comes out with a length of 3 and 7 eighths inch or 98 millimeters. The width is an inch and 7 eighths or 47 millimeters. The thickness is 3 sixteenths or about 4.7 millimeters, giving a width to thickness ratio of 10 to 1. The point was intended to be fairly large, mimicking the functionality of a spear point or hafted knife. The point design itself is triangular is corner notched and intentionally hafted low. A triangular shape, it was thought, should provide the sharpest tip for initial penetration. The shallow hafting was meant to penetrate just as the point reaches its widest cutting edge, reducing any resistance the shaft may have entering the body cavity. Basically, a wider cut should spread more easily and allow easier penetration with the least amount of resistance. As you can see in the picture, I also have an obsidian backup with an excurvate design. This design intended to address the same shaft entry concerns, and it was always meant to just be used as a backup if and when needed. 
The hafting itself is noticeably not traditional. This is the finest two-part epoxy pitch money can buy. Again, I wanted the best chance of being successful and having a sturdy half was important. It's not shown in the picture, but I also used a bead of JB Weld as a sinew wrap. You can see that here on the, sin on the obsidian backup. I'm more confident now in the point design and pressures needed, and I wouldn't be afraid to use more traditional adhesive and sinew wrap on the next one. You'll also notice that the shaft is nothing more than a 3 8 inch or about 10 mil hardware store dowel. While the point was large, the shaft was made short for several reasons. First and foremost was por portability. The conditions also of the hunt were such that carrying around a large spear in the dark with active dogs and people at the kill site would not be feasible and even potentially dangerous. It therefore more closely resembles a four shaft. While four shafts aren't known to have been used as spears, there's no reason to believe they weren't, and in fact, it would make sense in certain hunting situations where sizable game or megafauna were hunted. A point could be thrust into the animal, the main spear shaft pulled back, and a new point quickly reloaded for another encounter. This would reduce the need for carrying around a number of large spears. Instead, one or two spear shafts with a small handful of hafted four shafts would be far more mobile and versatile. In fact, we see in later technologies like the atlatl and arrow that four shafts were intentionally used, likely for many of the same reasons for portability and reusability. Furthermore, a four shaft allows the lithic to have dual purpose and serve as a handheld knife when not attached to the main shaft. But that's all speculation. It's one thing to have a hypothesis and a single experiential data point, but a whole other issue to prove it through reproduction, experimentation, or better yet, direct archaeological evidence. My only purpose here was to make something portable enough to use in this particular hunt. So this is just a little spear point made from Georgetown Flint. It comes out of Texas. Okay. And I just flint napped it? this. Did a haft onto a, a short stick. Didn't want to carry around a big stick and we weren't going to be throwing dark, darts in the dark. So just thought we'd try to stick the pig with it and see how well it penetrated. And it was, actually did surprisingly well. During the use of the point on the bore, I repeatedly plunge it in, hoping to cause as much internal vital organ damage as possible for a quick kill. However, this also serves partially as a proxy to damage that might occur if an embedded spear point, dart, or arrow was drug alongside the animal through the brush. Banging into the brush in the moments after an animal is struck could cause secondary and additional internal lacerations. Eventually, the motion causes the point to suffer a transverse bending fracture right between the ears at the basal end of the notches. There's also a small chip at the tip. My archeologist daughter, knowing my interest in Native American lithics, often sends me pictures of interesting points found during their surveys. Many of them show this same type of bending break right between the notches with some tip damage, and they're usually isolated finds. Given this recent experience, I could hypothesize a few things about these kinds of isolated finds. First, the pattern of damage is due to the low shallow hafting between the notches. Second, the pattern of damage may indicate uh, with a higher probability that the point was used successfully. And third, it also may suggest that isolated points with this type of damage may be good indicators of kill sites, with the point being removed and discarded or the animal expired and was not recovered by the humans. This could make isolated finds more interesting than they're usually thought to be. Isolated point finds are often documented and then left behind by survey crews, and archaeologists are rarely interested in following up on them. It could be an interesting study for some motivated grad student to look through the survey crew data and pictures, identify points with this pattern of breakage, recover them, and perform protein residue analysis on them. Tests of the soil could also produce interesting results, potentially predicting when isolated finds could also be kill sites. This brings up the topic I most wanted to talk about today which is how archaeologists might know if a point was successfully used. In forensic science, there's been a long-used technique called protein residue analysis. It's become a popular lithic recovery test as well. Blood protein residue analysis has been used to detect families and species of animals an ancient point has come in contact with. It doesn't tell archaeologists how the point came in contact with those animals, but it does obviously give good indication of what they may have been used for. So how does it work? Blood is filled with all kinds of reactive protein molecules. And we're talking about these molecule residues being left behind 
and still available on some points. These proteins can survive in harsh conditions for long periods of time and even tens and hundreds of thousands of years. As you can see on the point used to dispatch the bore, the blood is pooled on the low surfaces of the flake scars. But maybe most notably are the fingernail scars, where the flake terminated early but left a small fracture just under the surface. There are several of them here. These have drawn blood up through surface tension into the cracks, where it's now well embedded and protected. Also note the step fractures along the edge seem to draw blood into the corners as well. It could be hypothesized that lithics with these types of fingernails and other fractures may provide a better chance for protein recovery. Flint nappers usually cringe at these types of defects. However, archaeologists may find them interesting in aiding this kind of analysis. To extract the protein molecules, scientists soak the artifact in a solution of hydrochloric, also known as muriatic acid, table salt, and a mild detergent that weakens the hydrogen bonds holding the protein residue onto the lithic. While soaking, the artifact is subjected to ultrasonic vibrations to shake and further aid the release of the proteins into the solution. Proteins from all organic life contain antigen molecules that are left behind from the blood proteins. These antigen molecules can still react with antibody molecules. This is where electrophoresis comes in. Electrophoresis is used in many biological tests, including DNA testing. It's responsible for creating the little colored bands commonly associated with DNA testing. A thin jello-like medium is used and molecules can move through it when stimulated with electricity. The lithics antigen solution is put into pockets on one end of the medium and various testing antibodies on the other end. Electricity is applied and pushes the antigens and antibodies towards each other. Where they meet and react, they produce a recognizable set of lines. Comparing the line patterns to known patterns can identify, at least to the family, the type of animal contacted by the lithic. So something like cervidae would mean that the point had contact with elk, deer, or moose. Proboscidean matches would mean an elephant species of some sort, as is the case for a 12,000-year-old hasket point found in the desert flats of Utah. This is a very interesting use of a sound forensic science applied in archaeology that gives us just a small peek into how certain lithics were potentially used and what wildlife their makers were interacting with. We sent it to California to have it tested for blood residue analysis and it tested positive for elephant protein residue. This is a big tool for taking apart a big animal. When we got that result, we took the, the tool that George found in 1987 and tested it. It also tested positive for elephant protein residue. These are tools that were used to butcher that animal. Was this an isolated artifact that somebody tossed away as they were, you know, walking away? Or did this indicate the presence of some secondary work area at some distance from the mammoth? So we opened up the area that became known as the chopper block. And these are our excavations from that area. What we found was quite a surprise. I want to give a big thanks to Jacob, Curry, Cody, Jason, Ty, and Joseph for taking me on such a great adventure and giving me the opportunity to test one of my own blades in the real world. I've left some references used for this presentation in the description if you're interested. One of the guys here made the point. Guys have been, they've been killing them with rocks longer than they have bullets. So For sure. They've probably been using dogs for that long too. Yeah.